I'm getting a train just about time here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm recording this, so it's okay. Right, one minute to go. Why has it started taking so long? Because you're asking to extend it, right? Yeah. everyone and welcome to the final instalment of the Labour News Agenda uh, which we're bringing you from the Labour Party conference which Keir Starmer last night said was the best party at his party conference at uh, the Mirror Party last night so uh, a hangover from which I'm afraid I'm still lumbered with so uh, we're going to be having some fairly snippy questioning with Emily <laughs> and probably forgetting what my script says. Um, today I am joined by the Shadow International Trade Secretary and MP for S Islington South and Finsbury, got it right, Emily Thornbury, thank you for coming Emily, um, and we, this is the People's Paper Review so we want you to get involved, get into the comments, ask us whatever's on your mind and we will do our best to answer them for you. So what have we got today? Well, the mirror has splashed on that thing that David Lammy was calling for when he was on our broadcast on Monday, which is some concrete policies by Christmas. And here we are, his speech today is going to talk about recruiting thousands of new teachers to help uh, all those children who missed out on their education and all the failing schools in the country. Now, Emily, your boss has said he's going to fund this with 1.7 billion from taxing private schools, which is going to please 93% of the country that never went to private school. But um, put some flesh on the bones for us. What, what exactly is it going to pay for? What's it going to pay for is the need for... I don't think you've got school-aged children. Yeah. My, uh, I've got family um, who... I've got family who actually are teachers, and they have been having such a difficult time. And many of your viewers will know, having looked after kids themselves off school, just what a difficult job it is, keeping up, not getting behind. And my heart goes out, I think, to, of all of the kids, the 14, 15 year olds who are just starting their GCSEs, who miss the first year of their GCSEs, who get to the end of the first year of the training for their GCSE, the lessons, and they just don't understand, mm. and they don't feel as though they've got it, and they just like, they're conf they've got so little confidence, really, because they haven't got enough experience in the world, really, it's all kind of just, you know, bravado. They just like deflated balloons, just give up. And it's, like, it's the number of kids who are going to have given up and won't be pushing forward and working on getting GCSEs. And we need to have more teachers in the classroom. There needs to be much, I mean, you know, the idea of, I, I say, my brother's a teacher, so standing at the front of a class where there's more than 30 kids, age 15, who feel they haven't really learned for a year, it is a challenge to try to engage them all and make sure they all catch up. So we need to have more teachers in the classroom and be able to work out who is it that is really losing out and make sure we focus on them. Because many of the kids who are at private schools will have had that kind of personal tuition, making sure that you know that they are that they are catching up with lessons, they're not getting behind. And they and can be Prime Minister. And, and, one day. 
<laughs> no, it's just that it's like you know people kind of you know people who already may not have had may not have had the greatest access to the internet may not have been able to keep up the lessons anyway may not have their own bedroom in order to be able to work don't have parents who you know can help them with like the odd question when they don't understand something that parents themselves may not have had the greatest mm. you know experience of education we have to crack that if we really want to be a country where there's equal opportunity we're going backwards so fast and the pandemic is just the worst thing that could have happened. Yeah. So it's still yeah, not the, the 15 billion that the catch-up star wanted before he resigned, though. I know, I know, and I know that schools seem to be always kind of lagging behind. You know, people focus on frontline workers, the importance of people in the health service. It's always the health service that I'm not saying they shouldn't be supported, but sometimes they then forget that actually it is also really important we look after our kids. You know, they need to have a proper chance. They, I'm not saying it's the only chance, but for many people, it ends up being their only chance of education. If they miss out on education, if they leave school 16, 17 with a bad experience of education, they won't go back. You know, they won't go back to adult education mm. later quite often. And as a country, we miss out on some great people who potentially could make a real contribution. Look, you've got a Prime Minister from a comprehensive school. A Prime but Minister from a comprehensive school. Oh, I'm it. unavailable if anyone wants me. A um, Prime Minister from a secondary modern school. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Now, um, the speech that Keir is going to be giving today, a lot of people talk about it being make or break. 12 o'clock, he's going on the stage and he's going to be speaking for the first time as party leader at conference. And a lot of, sometimes these things tend to be written a bit by committee and negotiations with shadow ministers and so on. You might have some insights for us. Is there anything else that we can expect him to be telling us? <laughs> I'm not telling you what I fed in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just not going to, sorry. <laughs> and I'm not going to tell you anything about any of the debates that have happened behind the scenes. No, so course. sorry, no. no okay. <laughs> Let's have to watch, <laughs> won't we? You're going to find out what now, Labour's had a difficult few years. Um, those, of us who, those of you who are watching, what would you like to see in Keir's speech later on? What would you like him to talk about? Well, how do you think conference is going so far? Get into the comments and let us know. Um, this week has been described as both boring and dull and also scrappy and vicious. And no one seems to quite uh, agree. There's been a shadow cabinet resignation by someone that most people had never heard of until he resigned. A whole entire union has severed links with the party in the last couple of days. Uh, and then your colleague Angela Rayner upset the nasty party by pointing out their own. Um, so how do you think conference has looked to the voters? Because that's the important bit. Yeah, yeah. And I'll be honest, what we tend to do is we get into conference and we descend into that and we talk to one another in a very intense experience. And sometimes it's only when you leave and you look back on it, you think, this is how it's settled. This is the impression that the public have got, mm. you know. But I think that if they're getting a truthful impression of conference, they're getting an impression of conference that, yes, of course, you know, we have arguments. That we're the Labour Party. We would always argue. We are the party of change. And so therefore, you know, we'll have different ideas of what kind of change we want, and we will debate it passionately at, uh, in, in, in hot, sweaty rooms, and it's a creative process. We do come out with new ideas. People who've been like on the fringes of the fringes with kind of what seemed at the time really weird notions, and then slowly over the years they kind of become more and more mainstream as their arguments become more relevant, more credible, and they get more friends and they attract more right people to that idea. That's what this is. It is a big, earnest process where we try to develop our policy and we inspire one another, and yes, we fight, but you. All of that is necessary if we are going to be a united party, the coalition on the left, the party that is there and ready for government. And that's what this is. This is what this is about. It's just like part of the building blocks of how we are and how we move forward. Mm -hmm. And I hope that what they, the impression that, that the uh, country gets is of a, a party that is full of ideas, that is ready to go, that really wants to have the opportunity to serve and and can make a much better go of things than this lousy government. Is it you the know, media's problem another then? Way. If we're if it's not 
if it's not appearing that way. Because, well, I mean... You know. <laughs> I, think, I, think, yeah, I, I actually think that before conference had even started, the media had kind of got a set idea mm. that it was going to be a massive great bum fight, there were going to be people punching each other in the bar, you know, all of this, and it hasn't happened. So they set it up as massive row coming, hooray, everybody get the popcorn, let's have a look at the late party, tear itself to pieces. And then when we don't do that, they go, oh, it's really boring. You know, mm. well, you can't win. You can't win. You can't exactly. win. All you can do is use the party conference, I think, for what it should be about, which is about debating ideas, coming out with a new policy, and setting out your stall. And you know, today Kia's going to set out the stall and say, "Please, have a look at Labour. Actually, there's another way. It doesn't have to be like this. Mm. You know, we're the party. We're the alternative party. We could be in government, and we could do a better job." Mm. Now. That negotiation stuff, it all happens in public with the Labour Party yeah. and the Conservative Conference and the, and the Conservative Party is more of an autocracy. They just tell people yeah. what's going to happen yeah. next, yeah. Yeah. Um, which obviously gives an impression of greater unity and stuff. But then when you have something, anyone that comes along and says something that's a bit off, off key here or there, it gets a lot of attention. Yeah. And Angela Rayner has sort of gained a reputation as the front bench, plain speaking, tub thumping bruiser. That used to be your gig, wasn't it? I'm still who I am. <laughs> Look, but you need to be able to communicate. You need to be able to talk to people straight. You need to say what you mean and mean what you say so people get it. Yeah. Yeah? And not mess around. Yeah. And that's all that matters in the long yeah, run, isn't it? Yeah, that's all that matters. Yeah. Exactly. Now, keep asking us your questions, everybody. Uh, what do you think about how the Labour Party conference is looking in the country? Do you, are you more inclined to vote for Labour as a result of what's happened or not? Let us know. Get into the comments. Um, but now on to page 22, where there are some things you could perhaps help us with. There is the increasingly common sight of a polar bear with no polar ice cap to play on. Uh, and Greta Thunberg has been uh, blasting the blah, blah, blah of international governments not doing very much about climate change. But, Emily, you think that you can fix it with Brexit. How's... what? How's what? that? Well, you think, you think <laughs> that Brexit somehow could be used to help countries fall into line and with trade deals and so on, so oh, putting, putting clauses in those trade deals yeah. to yeah. solve climate change. Yeah. How's that going to work? All right, so, gonna... so what it is is this, is all the time when we were in the European Union, we didn't have our own trade policy, right? And so now that we've left the European Union, we can have trade deals with other countries around the world. And actually Liz Truss has signed up 67 countries to trade deals, but all she's done is like take the ones that we were in when we were in the European Union take a rubber, take out the word EU and stack in UK instead, which is a great waste. Because what you should do with the trade deal is you should say, you're my close friend, you, you country X, you know, the two of, we see eye to eye, or we want to see eye to eye. I'm gonna let you have special access to my market. It's gonna be easier for you to sell your goods in Britain. Uh, but in exchange, there's certain things I want to make sure that you are doing. So I'd like to make sure that you are, you know, you signed up to Paris and you said you're going to get to net zero, you know, you're not going to be producing any carbon anymore. Trouble is you don't really have a plan or you haven't published a plan. So can we, within our trade deal, can you put forward your plan or at least where you're going to be by particular years? And that's the sort of thing you could have in a modern trade deal. And that's what we could do. And we were about to sign up a trade deal with Australia, who are good friends of ours, and we're going to give amazing, frankly, access to our markets, and that's another subject, frankly, because I think they've just talked about rollover, blimey. You know, <laughs> which I, honestly. Um, but you know, in exchange, one of the things they said they were going to get was we were going to get a trade deal that would have the Australians pinned down to what they were going to do mm. by way of cutting back on carbon emissions. And it's particularly important, quite frankly, with the current Australian government, who are not exactly pushing themselves when it comes to dealing with climate change. And yeah. they are one of the worst countries in the world when it comes to emissions of carbon. So they do need to get their act together. Mm. And this trade deal would be a way of kind of nudging them in the right direction. And they would have had to kind of put down in the trade deal, by this year we would have got to this, by this year we would have got to this. And that's what the High Commissioner, the British High Commissioner to Australia said Britain was going to do. And Guess we what? Done that. Guess what? <laughs> <laughs> Boris Johnson wants to shake the hand of the Australian Prime Minister at the G7. So they just get rid of it all. Now, I'm not, uh, this is not me just like saying, oh, this must have been what's happened. We've got leaked emails that say this is exactly what's happened. Mm. You know, so they gave up. And that was a great opportunity. There are lots that you can do these sorts of things. Mm. You can also make sure that you are, you know, you're prioritizing trading in goods that will help with climate. 
you know, so so all of the green technologies and so on, we should make sure that we have that at the front of the list of things that we're trying to make sure that we have access to and countries have our, access to our markets easily if they have the kind of technology that will help us. You know, what you need to do with the trade deal, really, is like go, well, what does the economy need? Where are we going? What are the What are the things in the future that we will see as the big industries of the future, the things that we need to give every chance and every chance, you know, and that we make sure in that trade deal that those industries get access to the sort of markets they want to be in. But also what we can do with the trade deal is we can say, but this is the kind of country that we are, and this is what we prioritize in terms of the other things you can do. So you can also put clauses, let's say with a developing country, you can say, you know, yes, you can have access to our market, but we do want to be sure that there won't be abuses of human rights in your country and if there are then to be honest we're just going to not let you sell your stuff in our, our market anymore and in that way trade can actually be like a like the muscle behind our foreign policy and can be a force for good so i'm quite enthusiastic about this I as you can tell, tell. I, I mean tell. I, when i was first given this brief i thought this is a bit kind of technical but actually once you get your head around it it is I, I'm, i've become a bit yeah, I'm a bit of a convert. I mean, I just think it's something that's, you know, it's really, if we get it right, it would be such a good thing to do. Mm. It would just, but, but you need to have a bit of imagination and you need to be doing a bit more than just like, like tr you know, collecting trade deals, like collecting Pokemon cards, you know, just trying to get as many trade deals as possible, as many pictures of Liz Truss shaking hands with people, you know, with flags behind, without actually thinking through what do we want to have this trade deal for? Mm. Every other country in the world, when they sign up a trade deal, they go, well, what's good for our country? Let's work out something and then we'll have a trade. But Liz Truss yeah. seems to be wanting to prove that Brexit works by having lots and lots of trade deals. Do you see the difference? Yeah, but we, yeah and what you're saying is you need to make Brexit work rather than just get Brexit done. Yeah, 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 you need to get Brexit yeah, it's to three work. Words and, and the other thing is, frankly, is also we need to look again at, at the deal that we have with the European Union the trade deal, which has so many great big holes in it. And people know it was signed on Christmas Eve, for goodness sake, you know? It was like as desperate as it could be, very last minute, you know, and they've missed out things, or they've put in things that don't work. So we need to sit down with goodwill with the Europeans and say, look, obviously this doesn't work. You know, this sentence doesn't even make sense. You know, can we just sort of like sort this out together? Be pragmatic, practical politicians. The trouble with the Tories are they're so dogmatic and they want to kind of keep banging on about Brexit all the time. I just want to, like, we've left the European Union. Now we need to get a deal with the European Union that works. Mm. We've got half a deal, but we need to make sure we build on it, fill in the holes, and get something which works mm. properly, both for Europe and for Britain. And in that way, we frankly, we're losing trade with the European Union. It's much harder for our businesses to, to export to, to Europe at the moment. We need to make sure that we make that easier, and we can actually increase our trade you know, again, but we're losing it at the moment. Mm. Now, we did have a question from uh, Mike, one of our regular viewers, but it's disappeared off my screen. Well, we're getting that back. So we're talking about perhaps, you know, selling green tech, our green tech or green expertise to other countries in a trade deal in return for perhaps them giving us something we want them in return and by that way improving climate change and That's using right. trade deals as like a multifaceted way of fixing the problems of every Whitehall department. That's it. It's actually the solution to everything. You don't sound you know? like the emperor of the world. I, I, I actually have become the emperor of the world. <laughs> <laughs> now Mike says, Angela Rayner was one of the highlights. And as usual, Tories are clutching their pearls when someone calls out their racism, misogyny and homophobia for what it is. There's a lot of people who would have felt exactly the same, despite all the upset. Um, and people go, oh, how can she call us mean? Um, a lot of people, it's just language that everyone would use to say, well, they are scum. I wasn't, I wasn't there, so I don't know. But from what I understand happened, she was saying, Boris Johnson said this, it's racist. Boris Johnson said that, it's homophobic. Boris Johnson said this, it, he, he mm. hates women. He really has a problem when it comes to women. He's misogynistic. So, he said, so she said, you know, here's the evidence for homophobia, racism, misogyny. But it seems like Conservatives aren't complaining about that. It seems they're kind of quite cool about that. Um, what they're worried about is the four four letter word at the end. Mm. Which is daft. Um, back to trade though, very quickly. Boris Johnson supposedly is off to India soon, yes. which is one of the worst uh, carbon emitters, and they've got human rights issues and they've got democracy issues and lots of other things. What should he be trying to get out of them on a trade deal? What would you get out of them on a trade deal? I think actually one of the biggest opportunities when it comes to India is also talking to them about the pharmaceutical industry 
and the vaccines. Mm. So, you know, the AstraZeneca vaccine that we invented in this country, the idea was, was that it was going to be made in India and there was going to be a billion doses in India and then they start making it and then they have their own pandemic and then the doses don't end up getting exported around the world. So I think the immediate thing is to try to, you know, try to work out how best to manage that situation. Um, and how we make sure that we are, we can expand the amount of vaccines that are available, not just to Britain, but around the developing world too, mm. so that it's properly shared. Because if we don't, if the developing world doesn't get vaccinated, there's just going to be more of these variants coming out and coming back and hitting the shores of Britain. And, you know, we'll, we, we can end up being in, in danger of a different variant that our vaccine may not be very good at fighting. Mm. So I think the problem of vaccinations and fighting the pandemic is not finished yet, and India is a key part of that. So I think that's probably a really important part of the conversation. I think it's a really big market, and, and they have lots and lots of barriers um, to their market, and we need to talk to them about that. You know, people famously know that there's like a 500% tariff on whiskey. For example, so there's lots of kind of potential wins mm. with uh, with with India, but yeah, I think it. As I said to you earlier, it is a question of of give and take. I think we need to be straight with other countries where we have disagreements with them, and say, look, I'm saying this to you because we're friends, but, and then raise the other the other issues too, and try and get a mixture of benefits, but also being using it as a chance to say, you know, we will be giving you access to our markets in a way that you've not had before. We won't have the problem that we've got with some of the other countries when it comes to agricultural produce. You know, some of the other countries that we're doing deals with, the farmers are really worried that they're going to lose their, their, their market because, you know, we'll get lots of cheap product coming in from other countries that frankly have not been, you know, where they don't have the same kind of strict animal welfare practices, for example, that we do, mm. and where it's cheaper for them to grow, you know, to, to, to produce beef, for mm. example. So we won't have that problem, but there will need to be conversations about about students coming over. Um, you know, if we're going to increase business with India, then more Indian business people will want to come over. So we need to look at that. Then if we look at that, then we also perhaps need to look at, is it fair to have a different system for India and not for Bangladesh and Pakistan in the way that, you know, normally those things go, mm. to, go hand in hand. And when you're talking about human rights and trade deals, mm. what about the honour killings and the rape culture mm -hmm. uh, in India, the cases of Jyoti Singh Pandey and things like mm -hmm. that. What could be done in, a, in, an, in an ideal world to fix a, what seems to be quite a really deep-rooted social issue? I think it's... Okay, so when I said that I was like, you know, trade was kind of... could fix everything. There may be some things that are harder to fix than others, but mm -hmm. I'll tell you what the other thing is. Is there is there are constantly stories about indentured labor, which is pretty close to slavery, you know, where people don't get an, an, an option. You know, they, their, their family has a debt and people have to end up working their lives, you know, to pay off that mm. debt. They, you can have conditions within trade deals about that, about slavery, about forced labor, about where people don't get an option as to whether to work or not. And you can have within a trade deal, you know, say, you know, goods should not be coming into our country that have been produced in that way. You then have a way of monitoring it. You have a way of policing it, and you say, if this is happening, we're not going to we're not going to be buying that product anymore. You can do that. In America, they've started to say entire product ranges. So they've said, you know, let's say cotton coming from a particular part of China. We will assume it's made by slave labour by the Uyghurs, and we won't let it into our country unless you prove otherwise. You can do that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, these are the kinds of these are the kind of you know, if you really if you're really serious about it, you can you can do things. But Make you, capitalism work for the socialist good. Well, you don't. It's like I'll put it another way. I say you don't just shrug your shoulders and just say nothing can be done. Mm -hmm. Things can be done. Mm -hmm. You just got to be. You just got to have a bit of vision and have a bit of strength. Mm -hmm. um, you can do it. Well, we look forward to see what Boris Johnson's going to bring back from India if he goes. Probably a deal to sell them tubers and. I mean, we know. I'm mean, sure that we rem you remember. You know, we, everyone was saying, "Why aren't you closing the border with India? This new variant's coming out." You know, and he wouldn't close the border. And why wouldn't he close the border? Because he wanted to go to India. You know, a good few months ago, in order to sign this you know, wonderful trade deal. Um, and so he keeps the borders open, and then, bam, what do we get? We get another variant of, uh, oh, of COVID comes Delta. over. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And all the problems that's caused. That's right. So, you know, a long last he's going, and I hope that it's worth it. <laughs>
<laughs> Down in faint praise. Now keep asking us your comments. Uh, what do you think uh, Boris should do in his Indian trade deal? What do you want him to sell the Indians? Uh, chicken tikka masala, I don't think they need it, frankly. Uh, they wouldn't be interested, it's dreadful stuff. Um, get into the comments, let us know what you think. And what do you think about the Labour Party conference? How's it gone for you? What do you think Keir Starmer should be saying in his speech later on? I don't know if you've got some questions that are coming in, and uh, our producer Ed will put them up later on if there are. But first of all, there's some good news in the world, and uh, here it is. Now, it is said that the only point of a hamster is to teach children about death. But there's a man in Germany who's found a better use of it, which is for anybody unsure about how to trade on the stock exchange. Uh, there's an anonymous German uh, who has got a hamster called Mr. Gox, and he's got it on a wheel marked up with different cryptocurrencies and two toilet paper tubes uh, marked buy and sell. And what they do, Emily, is he puts the hamster on the tube in the morning, the hamster on the wheel in the morning. Wherever the wheel stops. No, not in the morning. It must be at night. It must they're, be at night. Because they're, they're, they're always asleep well, during the day. Well, it's cryptocurrencies. They never sleep. <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, uh, I don't know how hamster traders work. Hamster, at hamsters night, but only work at them. night, I'm sure. They're probably nocturnal. It's true. They are nocturnal. So wherever, the, wherever the wheel stops, that's the cryptocurrency they then select. Okay. And whether the, mouse, uh, the hamster goes through the tubes, buy or sell, that's what they do in tranches of £17.50. And he's achieved a 30% uh, rise over the course of his trading. He's done performed better than Bitcoin. So I think the question is, Emily, is the Labour Party going to give everyone in the country a hamster? <laughs> because we could really trade as Global Britain if we had one. We had so many hamsters in my house. <laughs> the only thing they ever did of any excitement was escape. <laughs> <laughs> they used to sleep all day. If you woke them up, they'd just bite you. <laughs> they'd be awake all night, keep the kids awake, and then escape. I had no idea that we could make so much money out of it. <laughs> that's what they're doing, that's what they're escaping. They're, they're going down to the Bank of England late at night and, um, and counting up the gold and figuring out what they can. Now, do we have any more questions before we end? No, I don't think we do. Thank you, everyone, for taking part. Thank you, Emily, for coming along. And I want to thank somebody who doesn't have any thanks on these things that we do. My producer, Ed, who's behind the camera here. He sets up all these shots for us, he runs them completely smoothly, he selects all the questions and runs the trolls and so on and so forth, and he's been hauled down to Brighton at very little notice, according to my whim, uncomplainingly. So thank you very much, Ed, for helping us in doing all this, uh, and thank you everyone for watching, uh, and we will see you again on Monday from our normal position in the back bedroom uh, for another edition of the News Agenda. Bye-bye.